lot has been said that people say that, you know, the pandemic accelerated the future. But for Torsten, I guess talking to you first, you know, what were the biggest lessons and things that maybe you were working on at Transforming Age that you feel were accelerated as a result of the pandemic? Um, you know, for starters, I think just um, having a strong culture, valuing your staff, I think is huge. Um, and being available for the people that serve the people, um, you know, that we take care of. And building a strong network of, um, of support. And we'll talk about workforce a little bit more later, but I think that was one of the big lessons. The other thing is just technology has, um, you know, played a fairly small role historically in our industry and um, has really helped us, um, you know, be there for the customer, be there for our team members, and uh, show up when we needed it. So Anya, for you at Senior Star, what do you feel, you know, looking back over the last two years, kind of where do you feel that your organization now has changed as a result or things that were accelerated coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, I definitely would agree. Um, technology is one of those things. We probably pulled the trigger on multiple technology platforms that we probably would not have done in order to communicate and to get information out uh, very quickly um, in a very efficient manner. I think the the, the culture has always been very strong um, in our organization. That's a number one um, area of focus for us. But um, helping everyone understand, probably collectively, how this team really can actually move the needle um, together. And I would say as an industry as a whole, the thing that most impressed me is we were all treading new waters. We didn't really know what we were experiencing. And everyone in this room, I see a lot of familiar faces and, and those that did not uh, make it to California right now, um, worked collaboratively to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the most impressive thing that, that I saw. I mean, we were saving lives and we still are. I mean, 700,000 people in the United States have now passed away from COVID as of the record this weekend. And that's still continuing. So we've, we've got a big job ahead of us still. Uh, it's 24 seven. And I think we've all taken that to heart. Now, Scott, you're obviously on the investment side as, and also a developer there. For you, what do you see now coming out of the pandemic and maybe anything that you'd say would be a, a lesson from the past 18 months? Thanks, uh, Michael. First off, before I answer that, uh, thanks for having me here. Good to see everybody. Uh, this is I, my first Senior Living Innovation Forum, and it's clear I've just been cheating myself these pre previous years. This is fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, and before I get to that answer, would everybody, like, give yourselves a hand? I want everybody to clap for themselves. Why? Because for 18 months that you mentioned, we were all fighting for our lives. Think about it. This, this industry was in absolute peril. Uh, we had the state coming in saying you're not allowed to admit anybody. Um, you know, so revenues, uh, populations in the communities were going down. Uh, you weren't allowed to bring anybody in. This industry, which knew its way around the flu season, didn't have to wait for the WHO, the CDC, state regs to tell them what to do. They just went into action and saved countless number of lives by, by j jumping um, on the solution. And then, you know, communities got closed, expenses went up, um, cost of labor didn't go from 15 to 18, it actually went from 18 to $21, right? Because all of a sudden, this place, uh, their, their uh, place of work became a dangerous place to work and therefore they needed some kind of compensation. Then. We had a, you know, our group, we were getting PPE from the black market, from China, ironically, you know, uh, to, to have folks come into work and to show up and, and be protected and protect their loved ones. So, and then on top of that, you had, for the first time, seniors housing really making uh, the grade with the, with the papers, but it was, it was in a bad way. It was above the fold of the newspapers. It was like these communities all looped in together very lazily by the press, that said that senior living is their tinder boxes and their death traps, don't put your, your loved ones in there. That's a horrible dynamic to fight, to fight against, but I think everybody can experience, has experienced the explosion of this industry coming back and has had positive gains. Pent-up demand was a real thing and we're in, in many instances back to, if not better than we were uh, pre-pandemic. Excellent, thanks, Scott. So I guess I wanna go, I'm jumping around here, but I wanna go back to the theme that, of course, of Bob's talk is, are we being bold enough? So, Torsten, Transforming Age, are you guys being bold enough? Well, uh, listening to Bob, probably not. Um, <laughs> you know, 
We serve 14,000 people, and um, the way we have structured ourselves, we're a nonprofit um, based in Pacific North Northwest. Um, we have structured ourselves around five mission spheres uh, housing, services, technology, philanthropy, and helping other people in the industry. And what we're trying to build is essentially a holistic, integrated uh, system to help people throughout their aging journey. And I think the icky guy and the purpose driven is very much part of that. And um, we, f we throw a lot of stuff against the wall, um, investments into technologies, co-developing technologies from robotic clothing to senior living marketplaces to all kinds of stuff. And working closely with a customer, working closely with, with uh, our team members, and just trying to create something that is um, more of a holistic nature. I think you know Bob brought up a, uh, um, a lot of really good points, and it's about people finding their purpose. And in order for us to do that, though, we have to know who's actually with us. Um, so we're getting to know people better. Um, so we're working hard on digital transformation, on data, data analytics, business intelligence, and trying to just get to know the people that are, that are under our care and services better. The other thing that's really important to us is economic diversity. Uh, Bob brought up a really good point that many, many people that are coming down the pipeline uh, will not be able to afford private pay. So about 75 of the people that we serve are on the affordable uh, housing side and another 4,000 uh, predominantly Medicaid home community-based services. And the idea there is to wrap around services, combine services with housing and technology, enable people to live longer, healthier, and uh, more active, uh, regardless of your income level. Yeah, thank you. So Anya, I guess same question. I mean, as senior star, do you feel like you're, you're being bold enough? I would have to agree. After listening to Bob, probably not, although I walked up on the stage feeling pretty good about what we were doing. But I, I definitely <laughs> think there's an area of opportunity and there's a little bit of a gap for sure. But what, what I will say is, I, I don't think it's just about us. Um, I don't think it's, uh, as an operator, it's getting those that we partner with to be bold as well. So we've, we've made some pretty bold moves from uh, wages to um, increasing rents, uh, to what we expect from a partner on our capital expenses uh, per unit. Um, we've made a lot of big, bold moves there. We haven't been quite as bold in um, some of the operational changes, but we have them on the forefront of looking at things um, just totally different than the way the business operates right now. So we don't expect to have um, you know, all these different tiered management teams. We have flattened our organization, which we feel you know, very excited about. It's really empowered people. It only works if you have people that have like kind values with you and are willing to take risks. So you have to have risk takers to, to make this work, but we're, we're pretty excited about that. I think the biggest challenge with what Bob was saying is this gap, this 10 to 15 year gap. Who's in our building right now? how they want to experience their, the rest of their life to also bringing this new group in. I think there's where the, where the challenge is and we've really got to figure out how to create the opportunity um, for all spectrums, but most importantly, helping people understand what it is that they see as home. That is most important because it, it differs from everyone and purposefulness differs from everyone. So being able to customize that I think is critically important as well. So Scott, obviously in a, in a little bit of a different role for yourself, you know, you, you guys work with operating partners, but what do you see as the industry being bold enough? I think we're absolutely being bold enough. Um, and uh, it, it's a tale of two cities, right? You got assisted living and memory care and now active adult, which is the, the new it girl in seniors housing. I'll come back to that in a second. But, uh, you know, senior living, we're all part of this industry. It's a great industry. It's also a new industry. It didn't exist 40 years ago, right? Uh, back then, you had um, your loved one, mom, living in the back room, or else she was in skilled nursing. It was a horrible existence, right? You had Nurse Ratchet running up and down the halls. It was a, it was a bad, bad situation. Now, you create these wonderful communities, these wonderful communities, country, idyllic country club uh, uh, communities where you know, folks are living longer, happier, healthier lives because they have better nutrition, they've got preventative health care, They've got stimulating activities, they're making friends, um, they're safe, right? And through that, dignity has been restored and uh, folks have come off of bended knee where they felt bad because they physically felt bad, but they also felt bad that they were a burden on their families. Now, you've got an absolute sea change of that. <clears throat> and I think that the cis living communities 
uh, with memory care have done a fantastic job and they've built a great mouse trap, a great box, and it can be improved on the margins. But I don't think that uh, the pandemic and the lessons we take from that make wholesale changes other than keeping a better eye on your, your, um, your airflow systems and a few other things. Now, on active living, that's where the real change is happening. That's uh, some statistics first. We all know this one. 10,000 seniors turning 65 from 2011 all the way up till 2030. By the, uh, uh, by the age, or by the year 2030, 20% of Americans will be 65 or older. And by the year 2035, um, seniors will have, uh, uh, there'll be more seniors out there than folks who are 18 and young. That's a, that's a silver tsunami defined and that um, presents a tremendous opportunity that I think that the, the markets are capturing with the uh, act of living, which I think is a, is a fantastic concept. Bob touched on a lot of great things. Um, the one thing that drives us in our thinking, CSH is that, uh, is what Debbie Kafaro said, is that uh, loneliness is more dangerous than smoking, right? So you wanna create communities, never lose sight of the fact that these are communities and what's making them attractive is that we are social animals and we all want to be uh, driven to, uh, to cohabitating under the same roof. Mm -hmm. And you do that with uh, an attractive um, building and a lot of amenities and the granite countertops and that kind of stuff. But what really is, is the winning formula is creating an environment where people want to get together. I mean, most of us here went to college and you remember those days in the dorm or even a fraternity or sorority pretty good times, right? So I think that that is something that folks are getting dr drawn to. Um, it's an interesting sales process, however, in that um, what makes it tr attractive for investors is the fact that the average age of stay in active living is six years, right? In multifamily, turnover is 50% a year. Now, the sales cycle is a lot longer. People want to, they're treating it as if they're uh, buying into a place, even though it's a rental. It's, uh, it has the same cycle as, and length as uh, if, you were, if you were buying a home. You've got to bring the grandkids in, you've got to bring your kids in, and test it, you know, visit it three or four, up to six times before you make the decision. But once you're there, that becomes your home, that you had mentioned, and uh, becomes your community. Thank you. But some of the things you're saying, of course, kind of goes against some of Bob's comments. So Bob, I'd like to maybe ask you kind of the follow-up there, or your, your thoughts. <laughs> Let's get a little debate going here, because Bob, do you agree with, with what Scott's saying? I think what Scott's talking about is basically incrementalism around the edges, and it's not fundamental change. And I think we have to fundamentally uh, rethink. Now, don't get, I, there will always be a market for those who are pushed out. But bear in mind, those who are pushed out in the future into our setting, because of money, they're going to have a ton of other choices. And the on-demand economy has shown them the possibility of staying home. And not everybody right away wants to be at a place where it's everybody out for bingo. And so, though I agree that we're wired for human connection, I think that um, just selling community is not enough to rethink what we provide in senior living. Ultimately, it's connecting with that in what gives that, per that individual person that reason to get up the next morning. So, you know, to my mind, I guess I fear, and, and maybe it's more that I see my role, Scott, as more agent provocateur, and, you know, that's uh, hardly your role as, as an investor, but um, we're not going to seize the moment and take advantage of the real opportunities with an incremental approach, and, we've, and that takes shaking up the sector. So... Um I love you too, so we got that out of the way. <laughs> but uh, Bob, you wrote an article, it was March of 2020, or April of 2020, um, where you said that there's gonna be a fundamental change in how senior living, uh, assisted living and memory care communities are, are designed. You were an advocate of taking, making the rooms bigger, right, at the expense of the common areas. And that way people could have more room to stay in the room. I couldn't agree, uh, disagree with that, with that more. These are community places and people are going there to live in a community. 
And I think that, you know, that idea, which made sense at the time to me, you know, to a lot of people, was a, was a knee-jerk reaction to what we were experiencing in the, in the pandemic. People don't want to go to these seniors housing communities and just stay in the room, just period, paragraph, that's it. And as far as, you know, active living and your idea, I love your idea about having a super smart, you know, community of thinkers who, you know, write white papers and stuff, and that's great, but, you know, with respect, how is that different from Margaritaville, where it's five o'clock somewhere and it gives you a reason to guilt-free drink at two o'clock in the afternoon, right? It's a niche, it's a niche. And I think that if we're looking for a reason for folks to, to come to these things, incrementalism, is one way to describe it, but the real answer is people want to be with other people. And, and that's why you're seeing, and they want to be with like-minded people, and that's why you're seeing a 20 to 50% premium over multifamily right next door for folks who want to go into, uh, into 55 plus or age restricted. They will, they will pay a premium to multifamily just to be with folks that are like-minded. And they don't want to be on the treadmill with their champion sweats while, you know, the Lululemon woman in her 20s is, you know, running five-minute miles. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's, a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of things that can be done on the programming front, intellectually and otherwise, that I think can fit the bill uh, for folks to have a purpose, you know, quote-unquote, to have a purpose to get up every morning. Well, so since it's the Senior Living Innovation Forum and not the Senior Housing Innovation Forum, I may suggest that it's a yes and. I think you both are right. And the other thing that's happening is what other industries have already shown us is um, we're moving more and more towards personalization. Yeah. So it's going to be individualized solutions to whatever that person wants. Yep. Millions of them, billions that's, of them, okay? That's Lynn's so there's going to be a person Lynn's that likes about. and appreciates the incremental change in the granite countertop. There's going to be the person that totally hates that, and that's totally cool. What we got to figure out is what products and services are we not providing? What canvas are we not providing for people to yeah. paint their life journey, right? And what we're really chronically bad at as an industry is knowing the customer at scale. We know them in our community. The CNA may know that customer. The dishwasher may know the resident that's walking down the hall and they have a morning conversation. I don't, you don't, right? So how do we scale that up and how do we get to know people to develop new, better solutions while the other ones still apply? It doesn't mean that's bad and that's good. It's just there's gonna be more, it's fragmented, mm -hmm. right? And we gotta be smarter about how to address that customer, know the customer, they can, you know, I hear citizen, I hear activist, I hear whatever. It's yes and, it's yes and. It's millions of people who want life. One likes the granite countertop and be the activist, the other one doesn't, and wants to be what taken care of and pampered, the other one doesn't. And that's totally okay, and that's actually what we're moving. Already have gone there, yeah. and we're just really behind because looking at the problem with a with a housing hammer, right? So perfect, and that's a as I said, great plug for Lynn's talk tomorrow morning, uh, which is just on that topic of personalization. So I just want to, you know, just thinking of time, the thing we want to talk about is are the biggest challenges. When everyone here that registered all the operators, we ask you, what is your biggest challenge you're looking to solve? And anyone want to take a guess what it is? Labor, yeah, of course, we could do a whole senior living workforce forum, and, uh, but that's a tough challenge, right? I mean, there's no silver bullets there, um, but let's, I'd like to talk to you specifically, uh, talk to each of you about what, what you're doing. Uh, Torsten, you're doing some innovative things around actually housing some of your staff. Can you share a, a little bit with the audience about uh, what you guys are doing? Yeah, we'd love to. Uh, part of our initiatives are uh, workforce housing. Uh, one of our affiliates is called Dash. Um, they started uh, about 30 years ago or so in, out of Bellevue, uh, Washington, and they uh, provide two main product lines. The first one is uh, affordable housing for seniors, and the, one is affor the other one is affordable multifamily for workforce. So we've doubled down on that. Um, Kim Lovell Price is here in the audience who um, runs our affordable housing group. Uh, we had a few months, almost a year ago, uh, had SHAG join us. They are Senior Housing Assistant Group, uh, Jay Wolford's group, uh, doing phenomenal work with housing service integration. We'll talk about that maybe at a different time. But workforce housing is one of our focal areas, uh, bringing the workforce closer to where the customers, where we need them, uh, and providing affordable, um, you know, close uh, proximity quality housing. 
And I think that's going to be especially an issue when you look at the markets where our communities are. Um, you know, higher real estate prices, higher rents, and so forth. And so um, we're doubling down on that, and uh, we'll continue to walk down that path with the ultimate vision to have uh, workforce housing uh, close by each of our hubs, communities, uh, home community-based services hubs, and so forth, so we can um, provide a quality lifestyle, not just to those we serve on the customer side, yep. but also those who serve our customer. Interesting. Um, now, Anya, at, at Senior Star, you're a great place to work organization. I guess the, the question I guess I have, does that help move the needle? With that, in terms of hiring and onboarding people, do you feel that that, that has actually brought some, uh, some good candidates through the door? You know, I would like to say yes, but anecdotally, there's really not data supporting that right now, um, especially the last 18 months that we've experienced. But what I would say, um, our approach with being a great place to work has really been all centered around uh, the data of how our existing associates are feeling. And so um, looking at closing the back door on our associates. So if you understand how they're feeling, what, what their needs are, how to meet those needs, um, then that back door of turnover closes relatively uh, easily. Um, not to say we don't have turnover, but it, it definitely does close easily. We took a multi-prong approach with our, with our underpinning of Great Place to Work. We took our data. We recognized um, managers of people are critical. Um, the industry as a whole has a lot of long-term leaders out there, and um, I'm sure there's a lot of great long-term leaders out there, but if they're not great leaders of people, they're not going to make it. Um, and you're, I feel like our company will not make it without great leaders of people, so we've really focused on that. We also went out and we embarked on a complete uh, restructuring of our wages. And so our frontline associates taking care of them. Um, again, we embarked on a minimum of $15 an hour. We just made this uh, effective on 10-3. And then there's premiums on top of that. So there's tenure pay, there's pay for memory care, there's shift differential, um, there's weekend uh, difference premiums, all those kinds of things. And our, our thought process here is really, it's more like a cafeteria plan because we do believe the new worker has been rewired because of COVID. And people are making decisions on when they wanna work, how they wanna work. They also know what their value is. And so we've really tried to to create this cafeteria plan that you can look at our organization, hopefully see meaning and purpose in what we do, connected values with what we do, but then also create your own schedule and your own paycheck around what's most important to you. So that's pretty much been our focus. And when you see all of that working together, this trust index score, the great place to work, talks about a lot. Um, it's very, very important to be able to move the needle in all aspects of the business. We had 98% participation um, of the associate survey in 2021. So that's basically hearing every single person how they're feeling about the company. Um, not everyone's really thrilled with us, but a lot of people are. So understanding how they're feeling and being able to meet those needs or at least meet them in the middle or open the dialogue is what we believe is most important. And when you can have that trust, one-on-one -on -one with your associates, and we believe that's when the magic happens. Thank you, Anya. So if you all look at your lanyards uh, with the inappropriate stuff that's written on it, thank you, Charles Turner. Um, apparently, Charles has solved the labor crisis. So Charles, what is, what's the solution here? Yeah, you know, it was actually very refreshing what you said. So great place to work. So Jacqueline Kung, who does that research, she and I compare research. So we, we actually, oh, look, there we go. Um, we do our own research. We have thousands and thousands of people that work in our frontline caregivers that work on our platform. And one of the things that uh, she and I collaborate on and have kind of a violent agreement on, we talk about recruiting, it, but it's, it's, it's only half the, the equation. Right? It's, it's solving the back door. And the three things that are most fundamental on the margin, okay, pay, let's set that aside, but then it's respect of management, be, to be very specific, it's, it's training great leaders, but what do you mean when you say train great leaders? It actually comes down to the conversation around respect and then flexibility. The, com and the, the conversation around culture, and Steve Moran and I have had a debate about this, we're gonna have further debate about this, is the conversation around culture is, and excuse my language, it's, it's a little bit of bullshit, right? Um, when you, because your culture generally ends right at your activity director level, culture to your frontline workers is something completely different, which we can talk about later. But 
But those are the, that was very refreshing what you said. It's, it's kind of, if you, if you focus on those three things, yes, wages, um, the respect, specifically respect from management. And I guarantee you, and we'll show some, we have some data, we'll, if you come to the session later, we'll talk about, there's a huge disconnect between what facilities they think they're doing and what the frontline caregivers think they're doing. We asked the exact same question, and we got two diametrically opposed responses. And also things that we think are important or not important, things like you know distance from the facility, not as big of a deal as we thought, right? Um, so there's a lot of presuppositions that we think in our industry that aren't actually 100% correct. And they divide a lot of dialogue. But you, you did hit on the three main ones, which I think are the most important things. Did I answer your question? Did you want to add anything on the workforce front there, Scott? Uh, yes, please. Um, at Capital Seniors Housing, we, we, do, we do the four walls. We do the, um, the communities, and then we hire um, operators, uh, best-in-class operators, given the market uh, to do the to, to do the day to day, but we remain very close to that that process. And what we see, one of our operators, uh, Arbor, based in Atlanta, is doing. They've basically created their own HR department and to hire um, line workers and 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 other folks. They used to rely on headhunters. That's not getting it done um, because yeah, it is it is a tough thing to keep communities staffed. That's actually been a pretty effective thing, but. What's what's contributing to the problem in the supply chain issues that everybody's experiencing is is also relates to seniors and that 3.2 million seniors retired from Q3 of 2020 to Q3 of of uh, I'm sorry of 19 to, uh, to to 20 pandemic sped up folks uh, retiring and that's a uh, that's a put a big hit on the uh, on the labor front as well but the interesting thing I think is that what's going to be a byproduct um, of this, uh, uh, of, of folks um, having trouble getting their community staffed is, is, and we see it coming, inflation, right? Inflation is a real thing. It's, uh, we're, we're seeing it already today. The price of lumber is up 40%, uh, but it hasn't impacted what the government has done yet. And uh, when they start boosting rates, which they're likely to do, the Fed rates uh, next year, that is going to cause a huge you know, a titanic shift in the ability to get these communities built uh, to house you know, this, the baby boomers and the silver tsunami that we're talking about. That's, that's a big concern of mine. Interesting. So I want to just move on because unfortunately we don't have too much more time here. But you know, going forward, um, another thing that we ask people, of course, not a challenge is, but what initiatives you're working on. And Torsten, you said, of course, uh, digital transformation. So, you know, we all know that, that I guess it's one accelerant of the, of, the, uh, of the pandemic was that it brought a lot more technology to seniors housing. Um, but specifically, what are the things that you're doing? What do you think moving forward in terms of digitizing your organization? In, in general terms, uh, just becoming a digital organization, which means, uh, you know, re assessing current work processes, products, and so forth, and essentially um, looking at what, what's tomorrow look like. Um, a lot of it is around business intelligence, data analytics. Uh, we started down that path about a year and a half ago uh, with our uh, first couple initiatives. So we're trying to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, get to know the customer a little better. Um, and also the team member is really important. And so uh, wrapping everything into uh, you know, data intel intelligence and just collecting data and, and building that platform is really important. And that's not trivial. Um, there's a lot of uh, money, a lot of effort that needs to go into that to really uh, do it right. We hired uh, recently Mark Gaber uh, um, as our CTIO. He's leading that charge and have confidence that we're, we're you know, making a lot of progress there. Uh, it's about uh, automation. Um, the labor crisis is not going to go away. Um, at the, you know, the lower uh, value proposition where you can replace human labor with a machine, uh, we're definitely um, you know, willing and hopefully in the f in, uh, near future to do that. Um, so we can, you know, use the human labor and resources at the higher value proposition, um, the human touch and so forth. So there's a lot uh, that's in the hopper that we're working on. Um, you know, one of our initiatives is Vanesta.com. It's a senior living marketplace that's trying to open up um, the dialogue between providers and consumers uh, to show people how many options are out there. It's in very, very early stages, but that's kind of part of it. Uh, so lots of business intelligence and data and creating what we call the one customer journey, 
a 360 view of the customer. A 360 view of the customer is really important to really know who's, who we serve, yeah. who's coming in at the earlier end uh, too. I think it's a little bit of a, um, thinking on a curve, Bob's a little bit right, Scott's a little bit right. I think people, if we have the right solutions to offer and we rethink what senior housing is or what senior living is, I think people would want to come in earlier as well. And so just getting to know our customer um, a lot better than we have in the past. Okay. Anya, for, for Senior Star, just moving forward, I, I talked to you, I remember a couple of years ago, there was one of those you know, New Year's prediction articles where a lot of, uh, you were one of the people that were interviewed, and you referenced a book called Detonate, uh, and it stuck with me. This was back in, so you must have been asked the question in 2018 leading into 2019, and it was that you know, we need to basically blow this thing up and restart, um, but kind of looking forward and change things up. So where do you see kind of the industry moving forward, like with the investments in the areas that you think that Senior Star is gonna go to, to detonate? Yeah, um, detonate, I, I just wanted to speak just real quickly on this, but there's four principles behind detonate, and it really kind of ties a little bit into uh, what Bob Kramer said earlier this morning. And the, the first principle is, you know, follow the human behavior. So follow the human behavior when you're making your decisions. That's really number one. Number two is having, having this growth mindset. And I think that's where our industry really falls short. Um, we all think we know how to do it. We've been doing it that way for 20 years, and, and we hire people that continue to do it that way. And I think you have to have a growth mindset. You have to be willing to listen to what Bob said. You have to be willing to shake it around in your head. You have to be willing to take the pearls out of it as well as out of Scott and then move forward with your own organization. The, the, other, the third one is really um, accepting that the processes that you're putting in place today um, are okay to change in two or three years. So there's not an all in on technology. I mean, gosh, look at the iPhone. What are we on, number 13 now? I mean, so if you just said this first iPhone is it, then you know that would stop you. But if, you're, if you make a decision based on technology and you say, this is gonna be the best decision for us right now, and then we're gonna still keep that open mindset and we're gonna continue to improve those decisions, um, that's a third part of detonate. And the last one is minimal viable moves. And I think that is also something that uh, slows us down sometimes in our industry. Uh, we have to be willing to make little moves and be happy and celebrate what we've accomplished, but not settle and continue to push ourselves to make more and more moves. And so for us as an organization, technology is a really big piece of this, but it's also um, trying to understand that human element. I mean, we are humans serving humans, and that is never going to go away. I hope that never goes away, because that's really what makes this industry so special. But we have to learn to do it um, in the most efficient way. And the one ask I would have of all of you is to think about how we can unite as an organization, as an industry, around data. I mean, we all look at data so darn differently. I mean, just think about an airplane. I mean, they know there's 137 souls on board and there's two dogs, all right? It's plain and simple. The pilots know that, the flight attendants know that. If something were to happen, 137 souls, two dogs. In our case, let's talk about occupancy. Oh my gosh, the way we all report it is so different. We add respite, we don't add respite. We add them if they're in the unit. We know they're not paying revenue, we don't add it. It's crazy. So if we really want to improve, really improve on what we're doing as an industry, we have to continue this transparency that we've had with one another, and we have to get aligned with this data. And I know it's not easy to do, but, but we have to do it, in my opinion. Um, I just think this is so critical. Yeah. Well, that's a good plug for Travis from Point Click Care's talk tomorrow. It's all about data as well. So, um, we just just to close things up, I guess you know Scott. And a discussion, of course, it's always had is that a lot of these things need to happen. You know, we're talking about culture. There was a we did a virtual event last year where Denise Scott talked about culture that it takes five years to really invest in a, in an organization to actually scale up culture. And I was I thought that was a pretty interesting number. But also technology. You know, a lot of the operators always say that the alignment between the investors and the operators, you know, has to kind of change in order to really transform the industry. How would you respond to that, that kind of, you know, that, that I guess, thought process on where things need to go? Yeah, you absolutely agree with it, of course. Um, you want to keep up with, uh, you know, all the latest technology. You want to make sure that your, your communities are, are, are properly wired, that they are, are you know, working. You know, all the systems, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of computers, a lot of 
heavy equipment, there's a lot of HVAC um, that is constantly, you know, improving and, and evolving. Um, and uh, so we keep uh, we keep um, uh, tabs on that. And we improve on that. It, it does come down to a cost thing. You know, you what what your building is going to cost to develop is a has a direct impact on what you can uh, charge, and uh, that's always in the back of our of our mind too. Particularly on the active living, we're trying to make this um, we're trying to make our product one that really appeals to the, the middle market. Not just saying that, but actually actually does. And to do that, you want to target your rents to be you know around two thousand um, dollars in a uh, in in the suburbs of a of a major city. Um, costs going up, you know, we targeted trying to have uh, our uh, construction costs be in the neighborhood of about two hundred thousand uh, per unit, um, all in, and it's gone. It's now kissing uh, three hundred thousand. So everything that we look at, including technology, has got to go through the lens of what it's going to cost. But moving forward in terms of changing the dynamics between the relationships again, like the operators and the investment side, do you feel that there's there needs to be a reshift? I think I think it's I think it's working pretty well right now, actually. And, and and I'm a, you know, what we were talking about before with in what Bob was saying. I, I'm of the mind that you know the innovation in seniors' housing is the, the sound bite towards that is is directed towards active living because it's so new and people haven't figured it out. Um, people don't know what they're going to be trading for. Some of the first sales are taking place as we speak, but it, this is the newest. This is a new industry within a new industry, and uh, but for assisted living and memory care, I think we've got a great model there, and if it ain't broke, you don't want to fix it. Excellent. So just uh, last very quick comments, I guess start with you, Torsten. Ten years from now, what do you think is going to be your biggest challenge? Uh, still labor, and um, you know having organizations that are seeing our audience as a huge market opportunity that are coming out of nowhere, um, that are not in this room. Uh, Amazon is one of them. I think Apple is gonna play a big role. Um, they have the data, they have the scale, and they have the money. Um, you know, meeting the customer where they're at, and so for us to become smarter and smarter as an organization, and uh, connect the dots, um, create a holistic experience. That means we may have a customer that lives in a market rate community, maybe later in life um, uses our home community-based services, maybe wears a robotic suit, um, takes part of our um, holistic wellness programming, and we just get to know them better and better, um, and just becoming smarter as an organization, um, you know, with a growth mindset, uh, agile, um, yeah. moving quickly when we can. I, I really agree with everything he just said. The only thing that I would add to it is probably, um, the additional challenge will be what we're facing today and the way we're approaching things today. Um, that growth mindset is going to be critically important. So um, when we see a problem, which we all see a lot of problems in our industry, I think that the challenge is to seize it, to do something about it, and take uh, urgency with that. And if we, if we can't do that, then all the problems we've talked about today are just going to be magnified. Yeah. Scott, anything different there that you think will yes, be? Yes, um, I, I think the labor thing will be largely fixed within 10 years. I, what, I think what happened here is um, you know, we had a space race to get the vaccine out, right? And it happened, three of them hitting the market at once. Yay, USA, USA. And tens of millions of people got vaccinated on a, on a, on a daily basis. So pretty soon, we got the whole nation, or thereabouts, vaccinated, and it was time to get back to work. And that was like a wake-up call. Uh huh, what? You know, it's time to go to work. And... We had some rust on us. We had a little bit of laziness. I think that that is going to work itself out, and the supply chain issues are going to be solved by in 10 years. What it, what does worry me though is uh, again inflation and what the cost it's going to be to 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 cr to create and to develop these new communities. Thank you guys for for braving the sun and uh, for sharing your perspective.